left deceived. Chapter 24 Jesus, the thief that comes in the night. When Jesus was sharing about the very end times, he likened his return or second coming to a thief in the night. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 42 through 44. Now this scripture alone should make you think that we certainly need to be ready, as the emphasis is on suddenly and unexpected. If the secret rapture pre-tribbers are correct, there would be no reason to really be ready at the secret rapture because according to their theoretical theology, a person can still repent and get saved and get ready afterwards during the great tribulation period. So why does Jesus and all the apostles give great admonition and urgency to be ready at the first wave if there is a second wave too? All the verbiage about a thief in the night consistently conveys being vigilant and watchful, awake and ready because, as you will clearly see, the rapture is rapidly succeeded by the fiery destruction of the wicked, the unbelieving and the annihilation of this old, defiled, decrepit world. I've scoured the scriptures and I can't find any language or terminology that even hints of a secret first wave rapture and then a second wave rescue at his final coming, which would actually be a third coming. Basically, it doesn't make sense unless you start dancing about to do the vain wrangling and the jitterbug juggle or New Testament twist of scripture. So if Jesus was talking about the church being secretly caught away, raptured and the Holy Spirit is taken too, as many pre-tribulation people think, then why do so many other passages speak that God sends fiery judgment at the same time and moment? Another question, if all the church and Holy Spirit is taken from the earth, then wouldn't the world not have any light or witness within it at all? How can people get saved afterwards? It's already hard enough as it is with the church and Holy Spirit here now. Romans 10 14 through 15 tells us, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. If all the church is raptured and the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, and there is no man or spirit of God to compel men with the gospel, then how will they get saved in this, supposedly, tribulation time? More importantly, why prolong the earth's suffering and judgment after the rapture, which is a form of judgment that God has judged those who are worthy and those who are not? No, God always swiftly judged both the righteous and wicked at or in the same hour. As we shall see, all the scriptures dealing with the second coming reveal that Christ comes and raptures his true holy bride, the remnant church, then destroys the world in the same moment. One of the prominent scripture passages that clearly cements that the second coming of Christ, the rapture and the day of the Lord, are all the same event is found in 2 Peter chapter 3. Please read the whole chapter, and you will clearly see that Peter begins by talking about the second coming, and then uses the phrase, the day of the Lord, in the same context, referring to the same event. Let's just read it. Most importantly, you must understand that in the last days, Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Where is the promise of His coming, they will ask. Ever since our fathers fell asleep, everything continues as it has from the beginning of creation. But they deliberately overlook the fact that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of water, and by water, through which the world of that time perished in the flood. And by that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Beloved, do not let this one thing escape your notice. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. So here Peter is clearly talking about the second coming, and then he says in the same breath and context, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Again, Jesus and all the apostles used a thief analogy over and over again to describe the second coming of Christ. It is the same language because it is the same event. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, 
and the earth and its works will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and hasten the coming day of God, when the heavens will be destroyed by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3, 3-13 so the illogic of some people is that every time Peter used a different word phrase in this passage, such as his coming, day of judgment, day of the Lord, or coming day of God, he was not describing the same event, that is, his second coming, but his different terms meant different events placed on a timeline. This has to be one of the most egregious and erroneous attempts at trying to make a square doctrine fit in a round hole. More dangerously, twisting the word to fit a fashionable false doctrine— First of all, Peter does not discuss any distinctions or timeline elements to these various terms. He interchanges these expressions fluidly, clearly speaking about one event. In both 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and in 2 Peter 3, 10, the most prominent apostles use the same term, Day of the Lord, to refer to Christ's coming as a thief in the night. On the testimony of three witnesses, let every word be established. Thus, the Apostle John shares what Christ tells the church, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Revelation 3, 3 The thief in the night phrase itself denotes that Christ is returning not during sunshiny days, free from suffering or tribulation, but in the blackness of the night, in times of spiritual darkness and oppression. Time and time again we read in Holy Scripture, God warning believers to be faithful and ready, even in tribulation and hardship. Christ also makes reference of him being a thief in the night when he returns. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew 24, 43, and 44. It only makes total sense that the day of Christ's return is the same day as the day of the Lord and judgment of the wicked, because Christ comes to redeem or rescue His people before He sends the fiery destruction upon the wicked. The truth is, this is exactly how God has done judgment in the past, and what's strikingly and so evidently clear is that Christ Himself confirms this in other passages that it should blow your mind away when you actually see it in Scripture. In Luke 17, 26-30, we read it so clearly, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. How more clear can that be? Noah was shut up in the ark, rescued, but on the same day that it rained and judgment fell on the wicked. The same day that Lot barely escaped with his life from Sodom is the same exact day it rained fire on Sodom. So likewise it will be on the day the Son of Man is revealed. The same day Christ raptures his church, the same day he destroys the world, on the great and terrible day of the Lord. We are urgently told to be ready, because at His coming, it's game over. The door will be shut. This is why Jesus said to remember Lot's wife. This is why Jesus warned us not to go back into our houses to get our possessions, etc., or hesitate on the day of His coming. Why? Because it's a spiritual condition, my friends. If your heart is so in love with this world down here, and you feel a sense of dread, or even a slight hesitancy for Christ to return, this is a big red flag indicating that you're not really right or ready for His return. The scriptures clearly indicate that those who are ready are longing, are yearning for His appearing. Paul states in 2 Timothy 4, 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved His appearing. Just a few days ago, I was awakened out of my sleep at what sounded to me like trumpets blowing. I immediately got excited and my heart leapt with the idea that Jesus was returning in that moment. 
Then I realized that it was the sound of a nearby train whistle that echoed in the night. I laid my head back down on my pillow, disappointed, grumbling and mumbling back to sleep, praying to the Lord to not delay His coming. You see, those who are really ready will seek the skies every day, hoping, wishing for His coming. If this isn't you, then I'm afraid. There is something very wrong. You are not ready. If you have forsaken all to follow Him, then your treasures are not in this world. This fallen world is actually contemptible to you. But if you have played the hypocrite, or are just being a good little churchgoer, and your heart and love are still in this decrepit, broken, demonized, fallen, suffering world, then I am certain you are not ready to meet the Lord. Those ready feel no great attachment to this world. Please take heed to this word. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 1 John 2, 5-17 through Do you yearn for Jesus to truly come back? Do you scan the skies every day and dream of his return? Quote, So for many there is no emotional yearning for the return of Jesus. The best hope they know is a kind of intellectual theological hope, but an intellectual knowledge of what the New Testament teaches about the return of Christ is surely a poor substitute for a love-inflamed desire to look on His face. A. W. Tozer Please, my friends, the second coming of Christ is not a dead doctrine. It is a living hope. I pray this hope burns within you every moment of your life. Be ready and on fire for Jesus, for Yeshua. Put your love and hope in Christ and His eternal kingdom to come, not in anything in this evil fallen world. It will fail you. Christ alone is our only hope. We are already raptured in His love. Left Deceived, a book by Heath Christopher Goodman. Please don't base your precious eternal salvation or your end times beliefs on hyped up sensational books or movies that you happily slurp down with some popcorn and a Coke. Read your Bible without trendy rose-colored indoctrinated glasses. You will see clearly that Jesus returns in flaming fire to judge the world. There is no rapture event as portrayed by the left behind narrative, no great tribulation to follow, no more time or chances to repent and get right with God. There will be no survivors, except those raptured in that very moment. It is game over. You won't be left behind because you either fly or fry on that final day. There are no other options. This is what the Bible teaches and why we are solemnly warned over and over to be ready at all times. Please don't be left deceived.